Welcome to Paranormal Heart, a place where people can talk about their paranormal experiences. With your host, Cat Ward. Welcome, my friends, to Paranormal Heart Podcast, a safe place to talk about your paranormal encounters. I'm your host, Kat Ward. If you have any stories related to supernatural experiences like ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, extraterrestrials, local legends, or your psychic gifts, we would love to hear from you. You can be a guest on the show and share your story, or you can send me your real story for me to narrate on the show. You can reach out to me at paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. If you want to remain anonymous, I will make sure not to mention your real name. The new episodes of the show are released on the second and last Sunday of each month at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find it on YouTube, Podbean, KPNL Digital Network, and all major podcast platforms. If you wish to support the show, please share it with others, like each episode, and leave a review. It will help us reach more people and make them realize that they are not alone in their paranormal experiences. Additionally, you can now find Paranormal Heart Podcast merchandise on TeePublic. You can buy mugs, t-shirts, hats, and more. Please share the TeePublic link with others, and I will add it to the show notes so it's easier for you to find. Folks, prepare to be captivated as we welcome back a familiar face from our unforgettable New Year's episode, Troy Klein. Renowned as a space science outreach specialist and a remarkable medium and paranormal investigator, Troy's journey is as intriguing as it is inspiring. In this riveting episode, Troy delves into his poignant struggles growing up as the son of an evangelical minister while grappling with his extraordinary gifts as a medium and embracing his identity as a gay man. But that's not all. Troy unveils the awe-inspiring tale of how he forged a profound connection with nature sharing the remarkable encounter where a cluster of trees played an unexpected role in guiding him to his current abode. Get ready to be transported on a mesmerizing odyssey through Troy's extraordinary life. Hello, Troy. Welcome back to Paranormal Heart. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me again. No problem. It's It was a little rough trying to get our, our schedules to coincide, but we finally made it. I know. It, it really is a busy time in, in the cur- my current job. It's it's nonstop. So being able to take a breather and just sit back. I'm in my comfortable, cozy kickback chair right now with my cat, Gidget. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting here in this room surrounded by trees and windows here in uh, Annapolis, in the Indianapolis area of Maryland. Nice. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. So I'm, I'm in my comfort zone and ready to chat. That's good. So how did it all start for you? When when did your abilities start? Uh, for for those who have listened to him on the show before with Rob and Margaret, uh, he uh, Troy does have abilities. So tell us when that first started and how did you get into the paranormal? Yeah, it, it really is a. I think every everybody's journey, of course, is very unique and different, and and there's some similarities. And I think some people listening to my journey may be able to relate and others are like, wow, I can't believe you survived that. <laughs> At the same time, all the religious abuse. And and I'm not going to come in here and, and, and in this conversation, my intent is not to uh, trash or, you know, really knock down anybody's view of life, whether it be spiritualist, religion, mystic, whatever it is. Uh, you do what you do 100% to figure out who you are and what works for you. And your journey will guide you with this universe, and God will guide you into the place you're supposed to be. And a lot of those places along your journey um, are bumpy, and they they don't look so good. And um, when you look back on them, you're like, I can't believe that's what I believed or what I thought. But I would just advise people not to discount that too much, because you had to go through those places in order to get to where you are now. And it, it can look pretty sloppy. Uh, along the way, and it probably should, you know, we're just human uh, trying to get through this and understand it. So um, how did it all start? Um, It's interesting, on my dad's side of the family, um, there were stories as I was a kid growing up of mystic 
kinds of things that would happen. And, and it wasn't, uh, the vocabulary they used wasn't th- weren't things like mystic or spiritualist or anything like that. It was all couched in a more of a religion, a religious side, because my um, family, I was raised in West Virginia and it's very rural in some of the cities and towns that we lived in. And it was beautiful, lots of trees, incredible countryside in, in that part of the United States. It's just really beautiful. Appalachian Mountains and uh-huh. Allegheny and all Blue Ridge, just stunning uh, places to live. But where um, my family, my dad's side is from originally was from a real uh, remote place in West Virginia. That was It's beautiful in its own right, but it's places called Logan County, West Virginia, and War, West Virginia, and Man, West Virginia, like just these wild names, and Mingo County, which had uh, if people who are connected to any type of Native American history know that Logan and Mingo are uh, tribes, Indian tribes. And so some of these counties in that state were named after uh, these tribes. So my dad was raised there, but the thing was, is he was raised in a uh, area where there was coal mining. And anybody who knows the history of coal mining in this country, it's it's brutal. And people lived very rough, uh, difficult lives. And he was no exception, he, he and his family. And they would tell me stories of living in the woods and deep in the woods and living in these coal camps where they had just cabins and homes that were tiny, barely insulated, if at all. And in the wintertime, he and his brothers, or he had three brothers, they would all bundle up in the bed. They had one pot belly stove for wood in the middle of the cabin or the house. And they would huddle together and keep each other warm because you would see snow and frost blowing through the you know, cracks and around the windows. And it got that cold. And there was a lot of um, beauty there, but there was a lot of abuse in some of those areas as well. And uh, he went through, his, his father was an abusive uh, person, alcoholic and, and just abusive and um, used to do, this gets deep, but he used to apparently beat my grandmother and oh. nearly killed her. Wow. And uh, she eventually was able to get away with, with the kids that were there and, and they moved on and completely reinvented their lives. But my dad had all these stories about when all of that was going on, how he and his brothers would escape by running into the woods and living in the woods. They would go out and camp and hunt and uh, get their food that way for oh, like wow. a long time, days and days and days. And it, and it turned into a place, uh, the woods for my dad in the forest turned into a place of refuge and healing. And so that stayed with him throughout his life. And he imparted all of that, you know, into me. And he would take me into the woods. Originally, they did a lot of hunting and fishing and camping and all that. And being me, I was like, I only hunted when I had to, but as I was growing up in that culture, but eventually I said, you know, I'll go out and I'll shoot, but it's going to be with a camera. And I went through that whole yeah. whole thing and he respected that. And so I used to go hiking with my dad and we would scout out, you know, deer trails and, and we would go through all of these different places in the woods. I saw some of those, some of those breathtaking uh, views of nature were during those days. Um, like for, I have one that just blared into my mind as I mentioned that. There's a place in West Virginia called Dolly Sods, which is the, the second highest uh, mountain range in the state. And we were uh, camping and hunting up in that part of the range. And I was probably 15. And dad, of course, would get me up at three or four in the morning. I'd be freezing to death. He'd drag my butt up to the woods, put me on some stump, and I'd be just wishing I could be home in bed. I was a teenager. I did not want to be in the woods when it was raining or snowing, and, and that, especially that early in the morning. Yeah. And uh, I was sitting in this area, and it was dark. And as the sun came up, I was. we were right at the height of one of these mountains. Was, and as the sun came up that morning, it was beautiful. It had all the, the purples and the greens and the colors of, of the morning. And there was a mist, and it was cold. It was around November. And as, as the sun came up, all of the air, and there's a certain, I don't even, Rob Guthrie would know the weather term for this, but the air, all of the mist in the air became crystallized just all at once. And I could see, it looked like billions of little reflecting lights of glitter shimmering all around me as the sun came up. It was just 
one of the most magical, angelic things I think I've ever seen in my life. And so it was because of my dad uh, that he brought me into appreciating and seeing that. Like, he saw the beauty in all of it. And my dad was a very strong spiritualist. He was a minister as well. Um, but one-on-one, and when the people that knew my dad outside of being a minister uh, knew that he had a major, he was, he was really gifted. I mean, he could, he would have visions of things that people were doing or seeing or sicknesses and things of their lives. And um, he would, he was a healer as well. And he would go in and literally people would, the healings would happen. Like things would, ha- it was amazing to watch and be part of, and he would be intuitive. And so he would be, he would sometimes be leading his church service and he'd say, wait a minute, he would stop everything. He's like, somebody just came in here and this, 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 and this happened to you. And he goes, um, I just want you to know. And in the, in the vocabulary dad used was, of course, was steeped in, in the church world, mm-hmm. which I've later grown to know that sometimes it's what he was experiencing was his giftings. And he had a vocabulary that he was taught through the church to use to describe what he was feeling and sensing. I have a lot of those same giftings, and I could describe it in those terms, but I've also grown to know that I can describe uh, what I do when you sense something about someone. You know something you wouldn't ordinarily know about someone. Some people call it, you know, psychic abilities and uh, mediumship and all the different terms, clairvoyant, clairaudient, clair, all of the, all the clairs, yeah. which are valid terms. Um, but in, in the church world, you know, they're called things like discernment or words of knowledge and prophecy and they have all these different words. And I've grown in my life to realize same thing, different terminology. I and never even realized that. Yeah, it, that, that has been my experience. I haven't changed anything I do from one world into the world I'm in now, which is uh, I don't have a church that I go to. I don't I have a real problem personally with certain organized religion and bigger parts and pieces like many of us do. Mm -hmm. And I've gone through a whole deconstructionist phase of my life and reconstruction and I'm moving into a thing that is just now commonly just now being termed rewilding. (laughs) Rewilding. Never heard that. Yeah. It's, I think it's like a naturalist, a nature term that when you have a, a plot of land that has been, turned into a park or a recreation area or somebody had a farm on it, that later on, when you rewild that area, you return it back to its original form. Okay. And and what it was intended to be mm-hmm. and its natural order. And I think uh, often people who've gone through a lot of church experiences that weren't really meant for them or they were and they need to grow into a different direction mm-hmm. have to take everything that was cultivated and almost like, uh, you know, when you are, forced into being a certain way for years at a time because of your surroundings or the people in your life or your religion or whatever. And then you're given the opportunity to think outside of that and people deconstruct, they reconstruct, they go through all this, like, what do I really believe? Who really am I? You end up trying to revert back to what you were originally intended to be, what you, what part of the garden of this life you were put in to be. And, and you, you rewild it. You basically reintroduce the things that were lost and let them grow and and explore them. And that's where I am uh, in my life. I've really reintroduced carefully and prayerfully a lot of things in my life um, that would be, good Lord, I'd be thrown out of the church I grew up in for two thirds of the things that I believe and do now uh, because of the way I talk about them and the, the honesty that I have about them. Uh, but are they that much different than what I felt in my spirit when I was in, in those situations? Not a whole lot. Doctrines were tough and sometimes wrong and and really mean <laughs> yeah. to people of various forms. But the spiritual part of it, like the part that I connected to growing up in church, um, I still hold on to the power of that. And I can never deny how powerful and real that was. So I grew up evangelical, which shocks <laughs> a lot of people to death. My dad was an evangelical minister. And so... Um, <laughs> Me growing up as from day one, like my mom's dad was an evangelical minister. I was supposed to be an oh, wow. evangelical minister. Really? Yeah. That's what really, we all thought that's what I was going to do. Yeah. 
but the, there was one big problem uh, is that I, from as far back as I can remember, even to the ages of four and five, you know, I've, I've been gay my entire life and mm-hmm. I've never known anything different. And I, people are like, how did you choose to be gay? And I'm like, you know what? You don't I, choose. I, I did make choices, a lot of choices, and I chose to be straight thousands of times and it just never worked. I didn't want to be gay growing up. Why would you, right? Uh, in a church like that, because you'd be thrown out, lose your family, your home, you'd be on your ear. And a lot of kids do um, mm-hmm. get tossed out and they end up, uh, you know, being snatched up quickly by traffickers and all kinds of horrible things that happen to LGBT kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a real heart for that now. But I, uh, I always knew growing up uh, that I fought it. I didn't want to be gay. But what it did, uh, it forced me to think outside of the bubble of the church I grew up in. I knew that spiritually, I was having significant spiritual encounters uh, that were life-changing for me. Uh, I was sensing things about people. I was sensing things around me. I was uh, I would be just overwhelmed with the presence of the universe and God, like in my life, in a way that I, it's hard to describe how powerful those moments were. And they empowered me to do what I do now, like literally laid the foundation where I'm now. So I knew those experiences were real. But the people in my particular church were saying that, well, you know, you can't possibly be having those experiences and you're gay. And you know, you're going to go to hell and God doesn't dwell in an unclean temple and all these horrible things. And I, I was confused because I'm like, well, then how am I feeling these things? How do I know this is real? Mm-hmm. So much so that I would never deny it. Like I would never say I didn't feel that because I knew I did. I knew what I felt. And so and they were trying to force me to believe about me the way they believed about me. And I couldn't. So I remember thinking, well, I've And I didn't really come out. This is all internal dialogue happening because if I'd come out Mm -hmm. in those days, I would have been sent to, you know, Exodus camp or lobotomy camp or whatever. (laughs) And they would try to fix me and really messed me up. And that happened to a lot of people. Um, And so my inner, the inner voice, that God voice inside me that speaks was just like, not yet. You know, don't say anything yet, not yet. And so what I ended up doing was having this really intense inner struggle as a kid and a teenager and young adult, that was so intense every night, you know, I was really concerned about myself. I thought, well, I'm being told in a religious side that, you know, I'm going to hell and these things are terrible and you're, you're deceived. And on the other side of it, I am walking into the woods and I'm having these unbelievable enlightened experiences with nature and with God through the universe and all things that exist as one. And, and in a very native American kind of way. Um, and I, I'm like, this is really confusing. I'm, they're telling me I shouldn't feel it, yet I do. And they're telling me I shouldn't have these abilities, but I do. And I'm, I'm having all these experiences. And so I kept it quiet and got really good at acting uh, up until I was in my 20s. And wow. I, I thought maybe by the time I was 20-something years old, I would suddenly bloom, you know, suddenly I would be straight. (laughs) So I just waited for that switch, you know, and then finally I realized, okay, I'm, this isn't happening. And so I had to face up and look in the mirror and accept who I was and then start that whole journey of acceptance. And at the same time, I was, um, I was remembering and sensing and feeling all these really deep spiritual experiences at the same time. And so to go back to the original question, how, when did all of this start? Um, it really did start, I have to go way back to my childhood. Did I see ghosts right away? Did I uh, communicate with people who had passed on or angels and things like that? Um, in a way, yes, but not directly, not like I do now. But I can look back and I can see the influence of these energies around me in those days. And I can see the influence of being guided in the way that I was and the inner voice that spoke to me and, and kind of got me out of a lot of binds and messes, uh, all the way through it. But, um, the real experiences that I would consider to be, you know, quote paranormal, uh, I heard about a lot of them through my dad and his experiences as a kid. 
And I knew that when I walked into uh, uh, someone's home or an area we'd be driving, I would be overwhelmed with certain sensations like a, a good, bad, uh, this is dangerous, this is depressing, this is whatever. And it would be so powerful, I just thought it was me. You know, I just thought it was life and my feelings. But it, it wasn't until my adult life that I realized what I was feeling most of the time wasn't me at all. It was the area or the person I was near. And there was no one to teach me that, like that that's what I was experiencing. So you're, you're getting hit with all this stuff. You have no idea. You just assume it's you. And so a lot of kids that are sensitive like that uh, get really messed up because yep. they think they're a mess. And they're actually not. They're actually gifted. And they just have no one teaching them uh, what that is and that it's okay. And that you can feel that and it's really bad for those people. Or you walked into an area where there was a civil war battle and you didn't know about it, You just feel overwhelmed and, and all of that. And in West Virginia, there was a lot of stuff that happened um, with the history of that state. And we went through those regions all the time. Oh. And so, you know, I'm around it. You know, there's all kinds of stuff like from Civil War and, and the coal mining wars and all the depression and anxiety that a lot of people dealt with in that state. Um, I could feel it. And I felt the good, too. Mm -hmm. But it was literally by the grace of God that I survived all that and, and um, was able to get to a point to where I started in my early 20s really exploring uh, things outside of the box. And I went, my first, first real forging into this whole new world of, of understanding things with different vocabulary and talking about chakras and energy centers and all of these was in my 20s. And I had just uh, taken a job on the Navajo Indian Reservation as a teacher. And I was a teacher in the early days, and so I thought, yeah, I want to cross cultural work. I want to felt drawn to experience other cultures and people. And so I ended up being invited to the Navajo Reservation, which was incredible. Mm. Talk about a powerful place. Um, and the people there are they're delightful, they're amazing people. And I got to know them at, uh, after, over the course of the five years that I lived there. And one of the ladies that I was a teacher that I befriended was from Southern California and she was a teacher like I was there, but she was into everything like Stephen Halper and spectrum suite and all the songs and the music that went with that and, and crystals and meditation and colors and chakras. And I learned so much about that point of view. And I was able to embrace uh, during that time, a lot of that. And we would go, we would take weekend trips and go to uh, places like Sedona uh, Arizona, mm -hmm. which is a very powerful place uh, in the United States. I don't know if you've been there. No. The oh, oh only gosh, place it's... I've ever been to in the States was uh, Maine, and I've driven through Vermont. That's it. <laughs> Those are beautiful places. <laughs> they too. are, yeah. They are. Well, Sedona is in the southwest of the United States uh, in Arizona, and it's at the base of a canyon area. So it's all these giant canyon red rock lives and buttes and it it looks like you're on another world entirely mm -hmm. and there are known like vortices there of energy centers that are all converge in that area they actually have tours of all really? these energy centers in that area that you can go to and there's all of this new age and paranormal stuff happening all over the place there uh, they have uh, psychics and mediums and crystal shops and churches and you name it it's like a magnet uh, and it is powerful. I've been to one or two of the energy vortex centers there, and it's incredibly uh, empowering. And you can't help it. You don't even have to be gifted to feel what's going on in that area. It's so powerful. Um, but so I went there with, with her name was Pat. And we went there for, for various just to camp and to experience it and went all over the place. And... Um, so I really got to know, started to explore not only my own, you know, gay, straight life, my whole gay life, but I really started to get into, wow, there's a whole new way of exploring these gifts and abilities that I have. And so it woke up a lot of that, and I started to really just figure it out. You know, I didn't know a whole lot. I was just kind of figuring out what felt right, what looked right. If somebody did it, I would discern 
whether it was something for me or not, or if it was real or not, or if, um, like when you have a gift of discernment, you usually can tell the difference between truth and lies. And you can tell where people draw their energy. If, And I really am a strong believer that there is positive and negative energy in this universe. And um, if you're a healer and you're a light worker, you can pull from energy that is from the light. And it is empowering. It's beautiful. It's healing. But there are a lot of people who are empowered by pulling from very negative and dark energy. And you can feel that uh, when people do that. And it is uh, very empowering for them. Um, destructive, yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but some people are in such a state that sometimes if you feel the only way you can feel empowered is to pull from dark energy, they do that. And, I, and uh, my hope for them is that you know, the light can gently guide them into being okay. Because um, I don't think ever pulling from dark energy is a good thing it, for any reason. Yep. Uh, it, and there is a balance in life with dark and light. And I, I believe in all of that too. But Yin what I'm talking about is that. very different. Yep. Yeah. But yep. what I'm talking about is the negative dark side of things that uh, there are, even with medicine, the people on the reservation, there were people who were healers and light workers and then people who worked with the dark energies hmm. uh, as well. And so, you know, the Slytherins of our world. <laughs> 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 so uh anyway i i learned a lot through my dad my grandmother um had a lot of different stories and abilities and they never talked about them in in terms of paranormal they talked about them in terms of oh yeah i saw my grandma iota walking across you know the yard or i an angel came into the room last night or it would be things like that yeah and or they would sense or feel things about people or have dreams about them and it was ha happened all the time it was quite common but they never talked about it outside of uh, a religious context okay and because they were afraid to and people would look at you like you were crazy and he's a witch you know that kind of thing so yep. they they were very careful but i began to realize and learn that um it's all vocabulary you know it's a context and it is you can have you can talk about the same thing just from two different points of view and it is the same thing often uh so when i when i feel and sense something from someone or i feel like there's a, a ghost or a spirit or energy that walked up human or non-human to me around someone you know i can describe it and talk about it and in the church i would have used discernment like i'm discerning uh this energy uh or this about you and, uh, and i'm not being told anything that i shouldn't you know, it's that kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. I just I go into it. So I grew up pretty much being trained in a lot of ways in the church I grew up in through connecting, having the ability in those churches that I grew up in, they would have what they call worship services. Mm -hmm. And so you, there would be a lot of music. Uh, it would sometimes go on for hours and you would just, everybody would sing together. They would pray, meditate together. Sometimes the whole audience would just go silent and you would hear people crying in unison. Oh, wow. uh, other times you would hear people sp stand up and just speak a word of knowledge out about something about that church or the people or the neighborhood or someone there. And there would be breakthroughs. People would uh, be having abusive situations or having issues of depression and anxiety. And it would get called out like by someone gifted. And I got used to seeing that, you know, growing up in this. And people thought we were crazy, <laughs> you know, in the church world. And it did look crazy. Um, when when they real. when they called out the people, did they mention them by name or just uh, mm -hmm. describe this? Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it would be in general. Yeah. Uh, other times, it would it would be a specific person. Um, and for me, I, I started experiencing that myself. I remember one situation. I was in a it was in a service. It was during the worship part of the service, and uh, there was this beautiful just the spirit over the entire congregation. It was amazing. And I was crying. I was just, in the, it, was, it was a beautiful moment. And all at once, this woman I'd never met before just comes to my mind. And I felt so strong in me. You need to go talk to her and say that you're there for her and you're willing to go with her and meditate and pray with her and be with her, that it's going to be okay, that what she's gone through, like I was getting this information and I thought, she's going to think I'm crazy. I don't, I can't go. I'm supposed to get up out of my seat and go to this stranger and say these things. And I was like, I can't do that. And my heart was pounding. It was so intense. 
And I thought, okay, it's going to be better for me to go do this and make a fool out of myself <laughs> that, than, than sitting here feeling what I'm feeling. Yep. So I did. I just begrudgingly got up like, oh, fine. And I went up and I talked to her and I told her, I said, you know, I just have this overwhelming feeling about you and that you're here and you need some serious healing and we need to talk about that. And I'm here to just be with you. And there's a healing right there. That's, this is going to change the direction of your life kind of thing. And she says, no, no, I'm okay. Thanks. Thanks. No. And she just shooed me off. And I was like, I was embarrassed. Yeah. But at the same time, I felt relieved. I just felt all of that release from me. And I was like, okay, so what, I felt better. Actually, I'm glad I did it. What can I see? And wouldn't you know, about 15 minutes later, she got up and walked up and started getting help by herself. And at the end of the whole thing, she said, someone came up to me and I wouldn't have done this, but came up and I am so glad I did. And she was crying. Aww. You know, it was this whole breakthrough for her and her, she had a kid with her. And, yeah. Um, so I knew then through those experiences, that there was something significant and very special going on. And so I, I knew coming out of the, the church, especially being gay, where I've been thrown out for being gay, mm-hmm. um, I knew that there were experiences in that church that I had that were real and were powerful that I could never deny. There were experiences I had that were awful and were things that I needed to get rid of and not be part of. So as I grew in my adulthood, I was able to shake off the things that didn't work for me. And uh, hold on to those things that did. And then rebrand several of those things that I was gifted in doing. And so when I did that, it just, my gosh, it was like, you know, letting the genie out of the bottle. Is when I uh, was no longer bound by made-up rules. um, And could explore my spiritual mystical side unbridled. Within, you know, you you don't do it in some crazy fashion, just go out half cock, but you do it med- mindfully and with help and talking to people and seeking out people who might be able to help you out. And you pray a lot, you meditate a lot, you sing a lot, you walk in the trees a lot. Um, and, <laughs> literally? And you search this whole thing out. Oh, you do, literally. Oh, oh, no. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. And so, uh, as I, as I got through that, I started having additional experiences um, that were really cool. And one of them was I talked to Rob Gutro, who's been on the show. Uh, I told him about that experience, which, which led me into uh, working closely with him for the next 10 to 15 years on various investigations. But the story I told him, we were at work, and I had no idea that he was a psychic medium and that he went on investigations. I had never been on an investigation at that point. And he was just talking. So, yeah, I, I communicate. You know, I write books about paranormal experiences and uh, animals and, uh, you know, animals that have passed on and pets. And I'm like, really? And so he told me a few. And he said, have you ever had experiences like that? And so I told him, I'm like, yeah, all through my life, this, 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 and this happened. Mm-hmm. And I said, one of the stories was in West Virginia when I was an adult. And I probably was in my 30s at that point. I went to my hometown in Petersburg, West Virginia. And my best friend, he and his wife had just been remodeling an old Victorian house there in town. And uh, there was a lot of reconstruction going on, but it was livable. And so I went in to visit them. And this guy's name was Jeff. He's like, hey, Troy, when you get there, I'm going to be gone that night because we're watching over this old couple in such and such place, but you know how to, you know where the key is, let yourself in. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. So um, it was late. I got there around, I don't know, 9 30, 10 o'clock, and I got up to the front porch of this old house. And and it then the key was in the mailbox, of course. <laughs> and so I got it. And there was a little old fashioned doorbell in the center of the old door. It's the kind that you just turn back and forth and it makes a little bell sound. Huh. And I remember hearing it jingle as I was trying to open the door. And I shut the door, locked it, and I went straight up this old staircase to the room at the top of the stairs, just to the left, and where the bed was and where I was supposed to sleep. And I went in, and I um, just got everything ready, and I went to bed. And I, about four in the morning, uh, I was awakened, you know, by hearing someone at the door. And I figured it was Jeff coming back from wherever he was and coming in. 
and I heard the, the bell ring at the door. And then I heard the door open and shut. I heard somebody walk up the stairs and right past my room. And I'm like, hey, Jeff. <laughs> and nothing. Like, hey, Jeff. Nothing. And I'm like, oh, screw it. And I'm like, oh, I'll get him in the morning. So I went back to sleep. And I had a dream that this young man in his 20s, a dark hair, brown hair, like longer, real nice guy, came into the room and he sat, just sat on the end of my bed and just real pleasant. And in the dream, I wasn't afraid of him. It felt normal. Mm -hmm. And and we had a conversation and I said, well, why are you here? He goes, well, this was my house. I'm like, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I lived here. And I'm like, oh, he's like, yeah, this was the room that I I died in, in this area. And I go, what happened? And he's like, oh, there was a fire downstairs and the house filled up with smoke. And I died from smoke inhalation. You know, in my sleep, I never woke up. Mm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was real nice. You know, was, we had this whole conversation about it, the whole thing. And I said, well, I'm really sorry that happened to you. And, um, you know, I just, I really like the house. They're remodeling and doing whatever. And and then I woke, I heard at the door again. And then I heard heavier footsteps walking up the stairs. And I yelled for Jeff. And that time it was him. And he had just, it was 6.30. So I had been asleep for two hours since uh-huh. the first experience. And then when I went downstairs um, for breakfast, he said, he's like, I told him about it. I said, it's the weirdest thing. I said, why did you come in at four in the morning? <laughs> he's like, he goes, I didn't come in. I just, I, I got home at six. Like when you heard me, I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> somebody distinctly walked in exactly like you to his, oh, you heard the ghost. So and you didn't like, knew about it. I didn't even know. And he said, yeah, we've had this ghost we all joke about in the house ever since we've been reconstructing you know, the house. We'd be up on the third floor, and we would hear somebody walking around uh, on the floor where you were staying. And we always thought it was somebody bringing him food or somebody, and we'd call and yell and go down and look, and there was never anyone there. And so we just started finally calling him, calling it the ghost <laughs> of the house. And I said, well, this time he walked up the stairs, and yeah, we hear him do that. And I said, he rang, he actually, I heard the door jingle and he came up and I said, then I had this dream. He goes, what was your dream? I described the dream. And he had this pale, shocked look on his face. He goes, Troy, I know you don't know the history of this house. And I'm like, no, he goes, there was a fire here back in the early 1900s. And there was a guy that died here in this house. And it was a young man in his twenties. And I get chills talking about it (laughs) because I met him. And then after that experience of me sharing the story, uh, they never heard the ghost again. Like he was, he crossed over once the story was told. Yeah. He wanted, so he like, wanted a story yeah. to be told. Yeah. That's it. He just wanted to be acknowledged. Wow. Um, and that's all he needed. I don't know why that was so important to him, but it was. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I told Rob Guthrie about that. And he, he's like, wow, you know, he goes, you should go with us on, on an investigation. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and so he told me about it. And then he told me about, uh, we talked about a few other experiences. And one of them was my, uh, I had a dog growing up. His name was Pete. He was a beagle. And I had him for about 12 years. Wow. And uh, he was with us through my whole childhood. And when Pete died, he was hit by a car. Oh, I'm sorry. And, um I, it was, I remember uh, it was the year he was hit by a car was my first year of leaving high school, going to college. And I was detaching from friends and people because I was leaving. Mm-hmm. And my dog that I grew up with, I had to let my, give over to my dad to take care of. And so I was emotionally detaching because it was too painful to miss him yeah. so much. And I had learned with my dad being a minister, we moved every three to four years two different churches and I lost all my family or all my friends Mm -hmm. every three to four years. And I got really good at just shutting down emotionally and making walls. So I didn't feel the the grief and the loss for too long. And so I did that with this dog and handed him over to dad and then he gets killed. And when he, when my dad came in and said, Hey, Pete was just hit by a car. Do you want to come with us? We're going to have to go bury him. At first I didn't feel anything. And I was, I had detached and then I felt it. You know, and I, I couldn't go because I was so, I was crying, I was upset. Yeah. And I felt guilty uh, for detaching from him. And then he, get, he got killed that way. Mm. And I realized I never had another dog after that. Um, 
And I didn't realize that I didn't and why I didn't, but it was because I was carrying the grief and the shame of, of abandoning emotionally that little buddy of mine that I love dearly. Mm-hmm. And I was telling Rob about that. He goes, well, you know, Troy, don't be surprised if you don't um, sense Pete around you soon. I'm like, really? That's really sweet, Rob. You're so nice. I'm like, whatever. And um, (laughs) I was like, Rob's a little crazier than I thought. And so I really did. And so I got in the car and I was going home that night. And I was driving. I was on New York Avenue in Washington, D.C. I headed home. And I smelled hay in the car. In the middle of the city, I'm smelling hay, like from a barn. Yeah. And I'm like, what is that smell? And then I remembered that uh, that's my dog Pete was an outside dog, and we had we stuffed his doghouse with hay in the winter, and for bedding all the time. He smelled of hay <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my! And I felt him, and it felt like he moved into the car, tail wagging, excited. And I I was like, Pete, I'm like, oh my gosh! And uh, I started, I just lost it. It was so powerful. And the reason I cried was because when he came, when he came, he wasn't angry, upset. He wasn't uh, holding a grudge. He was so excited. He let me know that if he were alive right now, physically, he would run up to me like we didn't miss a beat and be licking and hugging and Aww. happy to see me. Yeah. And the only person carrying all that grief and guilt was me. It wasn't him. He wasn't blaming me. Yeah. And uh, I was able to let go of all that grief. And Pete came back several more times to make sure that I was okay. And then uh, we had pets, of course, after that. Yeah. Uh, and had beautiful long-term pets. But that that was like a really powerful experience. And then uh, I was hooked. And then I started going on investigations with Rob and the paranormal team uh, here in Maryland. And you know some of those stories uh, that we've talked about already on the show. And they were those were overwhelming. Those were amazing experiences. Yeah, that was. And uh, getting to know Rob a little bit more, you realize that he ask, actually is, in fact, crazy. <laughs> getting Rob, yeah, I, lo- no, I love he's, you. <laughs> <laughs> he's as crazy as I am. I don't know what that says. But he's been a, we've been, um, he, he always called himself a medium rare. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> so like he that. was always, yeah. he's now fully cooked. But he was, <laughs> when we both were into this, he was, uh, we were both uh, helping each other and venturing more into the into this uh, together with with people and um, guides and you know gurus and people that were able to help us out with all of these things as we learned and talked. And Rob and I had this. It's uncanny. It's like when I'm around people with abilities, I tend to it amplifies what I can do, and it tends to amplify. It's like a battery. It, it amplifies other people's abilities around me. That's what happens with me. And that doesn't always happen with everybody. But when I'm around Rob, we really do amplify and start having these amazing experiences and unraveling lots of uh, real big mysteries inside some of these ghost experiences and these stories of places that we've been together with our group. And And I'm, I'm of the ilk that um, I, I have been learning and still learning what my giftings are, but uh, I'm really into understanding what others pe- other people's abilities around me are, um, because when you're in an investigation, you need to use as much of anything you can hold on to and grasp as you as you can. And if somebody is shy or timid with their abilities, you can be gentle with them, but let them know that um, if they trust you, it's for them to be able to write it down or say it whatever they feel or sense or whatever it is their ability is, I want them to use it. I want them to try it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, nine times out of 10, they will say or do something that helps. It's that extra piece of the puzzle that we needed to understand what the mystery was. And then the validation comes and you look up the history and you find out, you know, all the stuff that led to what you were sensing and feeling. Like what you and I were were discussing before we were recording. Yeah, that's right. I, I, before we came onto the recording, I was praying and meditating just to be guided with the right energy and, and what people need to hear on this show, like anything that we can say that's going to be helpful to them to them, uh, in their journey. Um, and I just, I, I got redirected and it's like, Troy, this isn't about you. Um, you need to be thinking 
you know, more towards the host of the show and who she is and what her life is and abilities and, and really look into that because there's a reason that you do what you do. Um, and it does connect to your life and your past lives and all of the stuff. It's still part of that whole spectrum of who you are. And then uh, when I did that, it shifted all the energy. And then I looked down at my clock and it was 555. And so I looked that up. And of course, that means you're on the right track. It's change. It's enlightenment. Uh, all of those numbers for fives uh, happen. I often see ones. Uh, Me too, yeah. All over the place. And I've been learning more and more about that. But yeah, so that's, that is how it all started. And it really is kind of just knowing and then um, allowing yourself not to be afraid to investigate uh, who you are. Does that mean that I would ever go out and just throw myself into the middle of some wild paranormal experience I don't understand and with a bunch of people that scare me? No, um, I, I still won't do that unless I feel it's okay. And, and you can ask yourself, you can, uh, sometimes it doesn't mean I'm comfortable all the time. No, mm -hmm. but that's different than if it's okay. Yes. Um, and so often I've put myself into uncomfortable situations, but they were okay. They were actually what I needed to experience. And, uh, I always, I, every investigation I go on, one of the prayers that I put out there is if, uh, I'm not to go to this one, let me know and I'll turn around and go home. Um, if I am to go to this one, I'm going to keep driving and I'm going to be excited about it. I'm going to open myself up to whatever it is we're getting ready to do, but I need to be guided and protected. And when I get there, I have a shield of protection about me. Um, and around, we always start an investigation with a meditation and prayer for each other that we are protected from any negative energies. It's not that we, we allow ourselves to feel it, mm -hmm. but you never let something enter you. You never okay. let, um, anything attached to you because they will. They will. And uh, you don't know what you're dealing with sometimes when you go into these houses. You've never been there before. And there can be a, a spirit, an energy, a very negative, benevolent kind of thing that could be there that will be deceiving. And it will try to befriend you or make you think one thing and it's not. And you have to be really careful of that because it can make you sick. It can follow you home. It can do all kinds of stuff to you and your family. Yep. And you'd never want to put yourself in that situation. Um, and so I'm very careful with that. And anybody out there who's been exploring and getting involved in all of this paranormal stuff, you know, Godspeed, you know, more power to you, use your abilities, use them for what they're supposed to be. But also be very, very mindful and very careful. Does it mean you know all the answers for how to do this? No, hmm. that's part of the learning process. But you need to put out there to the universe and to God that, uh, I need to be protected and give me wisdom yep. and let me listen to people. And if I feel like I shouldn't be here or I need to cover myself and cleanse myself and shake it off before I go home, then you better do that. Um, and I do that every single time. Yeah, cause a lot now. of, I, I feel that negative energy sometimes can be like a virus. If it attaches to you and you go home, it's going to spread so to true. other people. Uh, sometimes you could just be at the grocery store and you don't even mm -hmm. know people and that negativity will just kind of spread to other people. So Isn't that yeah, true? you have to be careful with that. You know, that, that it's like sometimes if I, and when I'm talking to family and friends, if they're having a bad day or they just have a bad feeling and they call, I'm like, where have you been lately? Mm -hmm. And, and they'll be like, well, you know, I just went to the store or I was, and sometimes like, oh my gosh, I was just around such and such who, uh, you know, went through anxiety and depression. They're angry. And I said, well, then you picked up that energy and you have yep. it with you and you need to mindfully let that go and mm -hmm. cleanse yourself of it, but send positive energy to that person or situation Yes. Yep. at the same time. You're absolutely right. You can walk, like you said, you walk through a grocery store, pick it up, walk through an energy field you didn't even know was there, mm -hmm. and it can alter your day unless you're keen and aware of that and know that that's not yours. Uh, and that's hard. Yep. You know, sometimes you don't know if it's your energy or something you picked up on the way. Exactly. I've, I've and you have to pray about it. Yeah. I've mentioned this before, when COVID first started, um, eventually we had to wear masks everywhere that we went. But in the beginning, when we didn't have to wear masks, I chose not to. If I was feeling mm -hmm. ill, I would I just wouldn't go out. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I was at the grocery store once and this lady, this woman comes up to me and she's yelling at me for not wearing a mask. And mm-hmm. and because people were afraid, we didn't know what oh, yeah. this was. So all that fear mm-hmm. just spread throughout the world. So I wasn't going to have a fight with this strange lady. So I just looked at her. I said, I wish you much love and happiness. You take care. And I walked away and she had this look on her face like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just right. like, it's I'm like not- you reversed yeah that fear and energy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's exactly people how that's with done. so much fear and it's like i'm not adding to the fear we had uh sometimes like when we've gone on investigations if a team member if you sense they're struggling with some negative energy that they brought with them you stop everything you're doing and you deal with that first yep and uh rob and i have both done that with each other and people on the team and we there will be reiki healing sometimes it'll just be meditation and prayer but we realign and make sure that we are ready for that investigation. We take every single one seriously. Yep. Even the ones that people think, you know, it's lightweight. It's just, you know, they had a pet diet or something that they, they miss and they're going into the house. It seems like it's going to be good, positive energy, but you know, you don't know what led to that pet's death or you don't know what's going on in that family. You don't know if there's a ghost there or you're walking into residual energy mm-hmm. and often you do. And you uncover some stuff that you didn't know, didn't expect at all. I, mean, I was driving to one of these investigations once, and I I was sensing uh, a teenage girl who was struggling, and that she'd been dabbling with a Ouija board. And so what I did is I wrote that down in a notebook in my car, mm-hmm. and I tucked it away. I'm like, Ouija board, she's dabbling into these dark arts and these different types of things and pulling from the wrong energy. Because she, turns out she was in an abusive situation, mm-hmm. and uh, that she was opening up a Ouija board and calling on dark energies to cast these energies onto the people who were abusing her, and that's what opened up these portals in this house, and that's where our hell broke loose in this house. And when we identified it, and we walked in, and were able to do that, and close those portals, and deal with the family, and do healing, it, it transformed the energy of that house. And there, it was that experience where I learned something else about me is uh, we were sitting in the living room after everything was finished and the family and relatives were just talking as we're wrapping up. And they said, um, you know, do you sense any of anybody else? Like, can you tell me about the grandparents or all these other people? And I'm like, you know, it depends. Sometimes, yes, it just depends um, if they show up or if I feel it or not. And right then I did. I felt um, an old man that was, well, not old, but he was like 78. Um, And I said, he's wearing, he's got this certain hat on, a shirt. Uh, It's like bib overalls and like boots and all. They're like, oh my gosh, that sounds like our grandpa. And I'm like, yeah. And I just kept describing him right to the T. And suddenly the door opens and in walks the man wearing what I was talking about. (laughs) And I didn't know he was alive. (laughs) I assumed he was dead. (laughs) And they didn't tell me, and uh, they, everybody just had this shocked look, and even I was shocked. And uh, it startled me because I thought it, a ghost just manifested, and, then, <laughs> and everybody and sees it. Yeah, yeah. And then it, I realized, oh my gosh, I sometimes I don't, I can't tell the difference between living and dead energy. So, and it makes sense. Yeah, it, we're even though your body passes, the uh, goes still back there. to the earth. Yeah. Your energy is the same. You're still yeah. human. You're still. <laughs> that energy is still very much the same. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so I have to be careful now <laughs> with that. So that's fun to do. So we're at the tail end here. I just wanted to, you had mentioned that you wanted me to remind you to talk about trees. Oh, I do have a good story <laughs> about that. So in this journey, um, and through some of the guidance that I received from uh, one of my uh, Navajo elders, um, I was in bluff utah a long time ago and and she was uh, this this elder was she told invited me to go on to a walk with her by the river and she said she would introduce me to the river and i was like oh wow i've never been introduced to what i considered an inanimate object (laughs) yeah or a rock or anything like that and i had elders that introduced me actually introduced me to rocks and trees but this one introduced me to the river and she told me how. She said she went up, she respected, she spoke to the water. She put, just cut the water and put it on her face and she meditated and she absorbed the energy. And and she said, just greet the river, just say hi to it. 
And so I did, and I'll be darned if I didn't feel the personality of the water. And it felt like a really, a pet, like the pet energy of a pet you really love. Yeah. That real innocent, um, hey, who are you? Like, oh, yeah, that kind of energy is how that river felt. And from that point on, every time I greet water, the ocean, a river, a stream, I feel that kind of what I call pet-like energy, that yeah. loving, unconditional love. How did, how did you greet it? You just said hello or... I do. Like sometimes I'll walk up, like if I'm in a new area, uh, we're on a, I was on a cruise one time and I looked out over the water and I was just like, hi. How I, and I literally just talked to him like, uh, and I opened myself up to sense it. And I'm like, you know, I'm really thankful to be here. It's an honor to be in your land, in your area of this planet where you live. I just want you to know, I hope it's okay. But I really just wanted to say hi and I hope you will accept me. And I will feel the energy of that water wow. uh, greet me. I and never be thought with to me. do that. And it really is. And truly, it, it's a beautiful thing. You just kindly introduce yourself mm-hmm. and wait and see if, if it responds. And so I started doing that with trees. And man, I, I started, um, I understand tree huggers <laughs> now. <laughs> I know why they do that. But trees are powerful. Oh, my gosh. And so I introduced myself to trees and they really spoke to me and I could see them, you know, it's, and they could see me. And, um, so when I lived in DC, you know, there are trees all over that city. It's a very forested city. And where we lived in the city, uh, there was a old mansion across from our townhouses. We weren't the rich people, but those people were, (laughs) and they had this beautiful, beautiful giant yard with these huge old oak trees. They're hundreds of years old. And uh, I began testing the waters and introduced introduced myself uh, in that way. And I'll be darned if they didn't see me. Did you say it out loud or just think it? Uh, I I did some of it like when you're by yourself walking. I kind of said it just under my breath. Yep. And and then I also, you can do it mentally. You don't have to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. But it, it helps if you say it out loud somehow. But I did. And they would just instantly greet me like, how are you doing? Like, it's good to see you. And I, they were shocked and happy, but they were excited that I could see them. Hmm. Uh, and so see them spiritually like that. And I was excited. So I began to just kind of talk back and forth and greet them. And then we, Jeff and I, my husband, were looking for a house in, um, when I got a new different job. And we were looking for a place somewhere in Maryland, Annapolis area. And it was at the height two years ago, of the housing wars and people spending God crazy amounts of money. And Same thing up here we, too in Canada. Yep. Oh, it was hard to get a house and we put in bids and lost a lot, you know, all that stuff and you get disappointed. And so finally I was kind of just frustrated and I was really ready to move out of the city. So I thought, you know what, why don't I ask the trees? So I opened up to the trees outside my house as I was walking and I said, Hey, you know, I'd really like to find a place for us to live. And I know you're all connected and there's a lot of research on trees. Mm-hmm. that you can look up that's amazing about how alive and how community they are with each other and how they share resources back and forth between the trees and the grandfather trees and grandmother trees share knowledge of the forest into the younger trees. And you never want to kill those trees because then the whole forest suffers because all that knowledge is gone. Mm. And there's research out there on all of this. And so I was talking to them and I know you're networked and you're connected. <laughs> and as crazy as it sounds, we'd love to find a place um, in the trees, in the forest. And would you look, would you see if there's a place for us? And I just let it go. And I felt the trees hear me. And I really felt them like, yeah, we'll do that. That kind of thing. I'm like, okay. And I just let it go. I didn't tell Jeff. I didn't tell anybody yep. that I'm talking to trees like this. <laughs> and so um, we went through a lot of different, you know, houses and whatever. And I quietly would check the trees at each location. And I'm like, uh, is this the place, you know, in, in my spirit? And often the trees would just close up. Like I couldn't communicate with them. Hmm. And I'm like, well, this isn't it. Mm-hmm. And we went to a house that we really thought we were going to get. Beautiful in the forest, not too far from here. And the trees just were quiet. They were silent. And I knew we weren't going to get the house. And yeah. we didn't. And then we found this place. And as soon as we walked onto the property, I opened up to the trees and they were like, there you are. I mean, they were so open and powerful, and I didn't say anything. I smiled. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is the house. Yep. And after 
within just a matter of hours, we won the bid and we got it. I mean, just boom, bam, just nice. like that. And so now every time I go out, I talk to the trees and it's a place of healing. Mm-hmm. The trees are about 150 to 200 feet high here. Um, they're old, old grove trees. And uh, I've had people who, uh, a friend of mine had, was suffering from a brain tumor. And mm-hmm. I went out and walked in the trees and sent energy with the trees and healing to her. And uh, with the, her tribe and her people that worked with her, she not only survived it, but the tumor's gone. It took up over half of the inside of her head. Wow, that's amazing. And it, it just completely, the surgery took got most of it, and the rest of it shriveled up and died, and they were able to get rid of it. She's Her brain moved right back into where it was supposed to be, and that's she's amazing. living out her best life. That's good. It, it really, really is. And they're that trees are that kind of energy. Mm-hmm. They're unconditional love. Um, everything in the universe is animated. Everything in the universe is vibrational and living. Um, I reached out to the universe in one moment on the reservation. I said, if you are, if all of you is alive, let me know. And for one brief second, I heard the music. It was like a blast of a symphony all at one time. And it just blew me away. I was in the middle of nowhere on the reservation in my car by myself. And I'll never forget that sound. And then I realized the universe is living. All of it. <laughs> we just have to acknowledge it and talk to it a little yeah. bit here and there. That's amazing. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you so very much for this, Troy. Um, I do want to have you on back at, at some point. I I could listen to I'd you for to. hours. Like, oh, I'd love you're to keep so talking. interesting. Yeah, me too. And I know you have to go eat. So, because <laughs> we well, we started talk, late. Just, just so the people listening, the talk that that we had before the show was forty five minutes of this kind of conversation. <laughs> it was wonderful. There was a lot to learn there. So, thank you for that. I just wanted to mention, too, I had to look this up because I couldn't remember the episode number. If uh, Folks, if you're interested in hearing the other interview that Troy is on with Roy, uh, Roy, I I mixed your name with Rob, uh, (laughs) with uh, Rob and Margaret, it's episode 112. So if you want to hear that, that was a very interesting episode about a case that they they handled. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was our first case. That was my cat just in the face. Yeah, that's funny. Um. That was a double murder mystery. That was the very first case that I went on. Yeah. Very impressive. And you guys have to listen wow. to that. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the most powerful ones I ever went on. That, that, I can't believe that was the first one. Yeah. I very. What they were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. So if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Um, you know what? I will. Uh, I'm trying to think of how to do that. Like I'm on Facebook. Um, and I think you can just look up, I believe it's just. Look up Troy Klein. You'll see my picture there. And I was one of the, it's like Troy Klein one, I think. It's like I was one of the, I've been on Facebook for years, so I was able to get that name. Uh, You'll be able to find me there. And then uh, I'll go ahead and send you some information for people to get in touch with me. That uh, through you or websites or how the show works, they can get in touch with me that way. Because there was also from the other episodes you were on, I think if people wanted to get in touch with you, um... It was through inspired ghost tracking. I had the I had added the link to that. So, but if there's any other links, if there's any other links uh, you want me to share in the show notes, I'd be more than happy to add. I those. will send those to you. Absolutely, awesome. I'd love to hear from people. That yeah. would be great. Well, thank you so very much. I can't believe well, all this time me. went by. It's just I know it. I know it. Good My conversation. Cat is like jumping on me, she's like, "I'm hungry." <laughs> <laughs> much love and respect to you, my friend. You too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Well, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care of each other. And if you'd like to be on the show or have questions and comments, just drop me an email, paranormalheart13 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Paranormal Heart would like to extend a special thank you to PurplePlanet.com for supplying the music for the show. The views and opinions expressed on Paranormal Heart are those of the host and participants.
Paranormal Heart Podcast, Podcast, Podcast.